coming from you, job motherfucker! Oh, this wrecks my coronation! Everyone has been destroyed because of this freak! I won't allow it! These babies just saved this lame fast party! just pinholes in the curtain of night. Who knows? What I do now, I do for my people and for Camelot. And may they forgive me. This is my last act as your king. Do not be afraid. You sure you're ready for this? I'll do my best. Your best? Losers always whine about their best. Winners go home and fuck the prom queen. Well, now, Draco, without you, what do we do? Where do we turn? To the stars, Bowen. To the stars. Hey guys, what's going on? You are listening to ThisWeekInGeek.net. I'm your host, Mike the Birdman, and welcome to the new ThisWeekInGeek.net website. Yes, we are finally optimized for almost every device. Yeah, it's a new coat of paint on something that was old and, well, it wasn't quite broken, but it definitely needed some love and some tender loving care, thanks to the wizardry of WordPress and other headaches that we encountered late Friday night. But I'm not alone as we trek through this discovery of nerdetry and geekatry and all sorts of other words. I'm just kind of making up right here on the spot. I'm joined with my man in Kitchener. <laughs> Alex, the producer. Oh, yeah. So that was a fun Friday night we had. We had a, a problem with our old web host. And I can now say this now. Fuck dream host. Fuck you right in the ear. Um, it broke our emails in the middle of the night. And Alex sends me a very panicked. Uh, message and he's like hey mike emails aren't working i'm thinking <laughs> what um uh, emails aren't working two days before the, the official launch of the website and one in the day middle of be- console launch and one day before we were going to have a transitionary episode where we had a special guest star on yeah so thanks dream host we needed that headache i'm not sad to yeah. see you go in the least they, they can fuck right off with their <laughs> bullshit they're one of the only big sites out there that doesn't have standardized web hosting tools they have custom scripts that they force you to use on their own they might have been good when they started like you guys i don't know who your original host was but this is who you used or how we used uh from 2008 onward yeah so the first if you look at uh the website 1.0 was like a single page that somebody made in like like I don't know, like Microsoft front page or, or, or something. Or Drupal or something like that. It was, no, it was like hand-coded, single page. We're talking late 90s style just to get it up and running. Then there was a version 2.0 that looked like it was a Dreamweaver site. And then there was uh, 3.0, which was the site that I liked the most. And I think a lot of people, that for the time period, that was your, uh, remember the red site? Yes. Where you had all the benefits. That was at the time when Web 2.0 was just starting. With all the the commenting, this was like a concise, easy to read site before most people had mobile phones that had or or tablets that had to be able to resize. So it was perfect for PC. Then you move to this version of the site, which had some changes here and there over the years. Uh, so this would have been the previous one was, I guess, version 4.0. And it's had a few you know coats of paint put on there. Not optimized for mobile. 
it was almost impossible to navigate things if you weren't on a PC. Uh, and now, finally, I guess we're on 5.0. We want to call it that. Yeah. So it now works. We do have new uh, updated bios, which are up on the site. There will be more uh, coming yeah. in, like with new people such as Aaron Paulier, JT from Sas- Saskatoon, and other people who will eventually yeah. be joining the site. JT um, is up and live. I, I made sure I inserted that. Uh, the site uh, is stripped down to the basics right now in that uh, at launch on the main page, you're able to uh, see all of our, our new posts, uh, as well as play the episodes directly on there if you want to get to play it right like that. You can even on your phone, start, click play, close the screen, and it will still play. Uh, you can obviously read the articles. You can have it. There's a drop down menu for all the different shows. They're all properly categorized. Everything on the back end is linked properly. It'll load fast. You'll be able to search for whatever you want. <clears throat> There's also uh, a button that says listen here. What that does is it pulls up a continuous playlist of everything we have. So if you just want to have something on in the background and just go, boom, it'll play uh, most recent to our earliest stuff we've posted. Uh, so that's there. And, you know, coming in the new year, we'll have sections we can add like blogs and, and news and press releases, uh, even stuff for creative writing. If you wanted to put that in there, Michael, uh, new shows will be easily added and searchable under you know each category so it's not like before where pretty much all the new shows had been under the twig banner because the old site was so broken (laughs) it's actually dynamic and works yeah so really really happy to do that uh also with this comes the launch of several new uh programs which will be coming in the coming months there's one launching this month finally I got the I got the book club ready to go I just got this new book in the mail it's from titan books and it's going to tie in the future imperfect uh, indirectly. And it's going to be, um, it's the autobiography of Catherine Janeway. So I'll be looking at my captain, uh, the captain of the uh, USS Voyager. It's her autobiography. I'll be reading that in the next week or so. And I should have an episode out. I'm going to say just after console launch, hopefully. Um, I am also working uh, on a new actual play podcast. We have three cast members confirmed so far with a fourth one. I'm just working out kind of details with it. Uh, So we will be launching a new actual play podcast uh, based on Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, but also on the recently completed Stargate SG-1 Kickstarter from Wyvern Games, which had a massively successful Kickstarter. Yeah, Um, nearly half a million. Yeah, uh, something like 6,500 plus backers. And 6,500 plus backers giving half a million dollars, that's a lot of money for a very small group of fans. So this shows MGM, there's still life in this license. And that's not counting, you know, whatever people are going to do add-ons for. Yeah, like I myself backed for the physical book. I've got the Game Master screen and I got the Phoenix Sight Patch. Um, Liam Larson, uh, who is going to be uh, one of our players for this game, went all in for the gamer bundle. So he's got all the digital uh, 3D files. He'll have the Phoenix Sight Pass, the Game Master screen, the dice, the determination point chips. Um, so he's all in. He got the cool Stargate Command version of the book. Um, so that's going to be really wicked. Uh, looking yeah, forward I, to that. I had that tier, and then I, I I had some financial issues, so I went down to the digital edition now. But you can add things later. Yes. So it just it just meant that I wasn't going to be charged all the money immediately when I didn't have it. <laughs> yeah, like, but I can change that that pledge whenever I want afterwards and add on. So yeah, like it's going to be fantastic when this comes out. I know the digital version of the book comes out in. Hopefully about a month or so. If you want to find out more, I think it's StargateRPG.com or something like that. You can check out Wyvern Gaming as well, and it'll take you right there. Yeah, so we will be launching that in the new year with um, the name for the name of the unit we're following is Stargate uh, SG Twig, which stands for Tactical Weapons in- Integration Group or um we're we're the geeks (laughs) yeah basically uh here field test this new weapon from the guald or our or if we do a season two which i hope we do we'll have tactics weapons and intelligence gathering so we have alternate um 
acronyms all ready to go and it's going to be fun we're going to have ken lutz on the show uh who you may know from uh his other anime podcast plus we've been i know alex you've guested on his show before yeah so this anime uh and uh he's got another show and i think he's got a few that are sort of you know taking a back burner because he usually reviews recent movies but uh you know there hasn't been recent theatrical movies yeah so and and he was on with us when we were doing um uh the uh the test run that we did on twitch for uh shadow run yeah so we're last gonna... year so so it's somebody we, we know we work well with when it comes to these sorts of games yep and we're also going to have uh jt from Sa- from saskatoon he will be playing with us hopefully as well as soon as we get our schedules all kind of lined up the fact that liam now lives next door to me uh makes recording schedules really really easy so it's just worrying about ken and jt i'm sure we'll figure something out um but yeah it's gonna be fantastic so we're looking forward to launch that i've already hired a theme uh a a theme song composer who did the twig theme that's uh ori uh falconer who also did the music for way of the passive fist and he also did uh some other games i just can't recall them off of my head but i know he's like a, a sound designer for a fairly new game no, I maybe did he do use your words or is that another one of our friends? That's another one of our friends. That's uh Brentel okay. Floss and okay. Julian so we, Splane. We, yes, we have friends. Yeah, basically. We have friends. <laughs> so we will be doing that in the new year in uh 2021. Also, I will be doing uh blogging on the website hopefully once a week. I'll be offering commentary be it on just pretty much any geek industry or geek things that I want to talk about. So basically you're bringing back the Birdman prophecies after 10 year hiatus. Yeah, basically it's because I'm taking so many writing courses right now. It's a way to keep my skills sharp. Um, Oh yeah. There's another announcement. I'm in school for sure until at least the middle of February right now and probably beyond that as well since i got approved so what you're saying is it's a good thing we're streamlining how the website works now <laughs> yeah basically i'm so glad things work finally so that's a lot of what's uh, been going after, on after a week of uh and, and especially a 12 hour period where alex thought he was going to have a heart attack when things weren't working <laughs> yeah just <laughs> jesus they, they finally work things aren't broken i didn't jump off a bridge everything's good hallelujah holy shit so yes we are here to bring you uh an exciting new podcast as we do each and every week here on thisweekingeek.net obviously last uh yesterday you should have heard the uh special we did with james rolf aka the angry video game nerd talking about uh universal movies that we recorded a little bit uh earlier in the month so he did have some content that was mentioned in there that has been released such as the head returns and his video where he talks about the cinemasker monster or sorry, the universal monsters kind of being that generation superheroes in the interconnected universe thereof. Um, so yeah, uh, coming up on this show, we got a lot of stuff to talk about from the world of geek and everything else. As you heard off the beginning of the show, we played a uh, tribute to late actor uh, Sean Connery uh obviously this man had a fantastic career a very enduring legend in pop culture uh he will be missed his career is not without controversy but we're not here to talk about that today (laughs) but honestly nobody from that generation gets away (laughs) scot-free exactly It it just sort of is what it is and just be glad that he for for the most part was a good guy uh and he also did zardoz the penis is uh is evil the gun is good Yes. So we have a lot of stuff to bring to you uh, this week. So without any further ado, we're going to talk about James Rolfe right now, actually. And this is going to be my review of AVG, a- AVGN, or Angry Video Game Nerd Adventures 1 and 2 Deluxe on the Nintendo Switch. We'll be back, guys, right after this, only on thisweekingeek.net. Hey guys, it's Mike the Birdman here, and I'm here to talk about a game that I got for review uh, coming to us from Screen Wave Media and developer Freak Zone Games. I'm talking about the Angry Video Game Nerd 1 and 2 Deluxe. Bit of a disclaimer, I am a friend of James Rolfe, but I did want that to be out in the open just so there is no question of ethics or whatever. However, that being said, I did play these games on the Nintendo Switch uh, this past weekend, and this is also available on PC. First off, these games are hard as hell. The first game, uh, the Angry Video Game Nerd Adventure, uh, kicked my ass. I died well over 200 times, and I played this game on stupid easy. There were more than a few moments that were really, really 
really frustrating. In fact, and I'll just share this moment very kind of briefly. There is a level that was openly mocking me where I would die so quickly or I'd be like, ha, I got it. And then I ran into a death block and up dead. So that was kind of funny. Like I even said to uh, my friend Liam, who was watching me play this game live for review. He's like, this game is just mocking you at this point. I'm like, yes, yes, it is. Plus, the last level, Laughing, Joking, Numb Nuts, or LJN, I had a massive problem with, and not because of level difficulty or the final boss, the game froze. And it, and I was able to repeat this error several times to the point where it froze my Nintendo Switch, and I had to reset the game. So I don't know what happened. It counted the level as completed and beaten, but I didn't see the ending screen. It got to where James and his friends are jumping out of the uh, TV and the game froze. The music was still playing, but no text came up. No credits rolled. It's just the game's beaten. Cool. Move on. Uh, Angry Video Game Nerd 2 um, Assimilation. I enjoyed a lot more. I would compare it to similar to the first game in terms of platforming and difficulty, but with like this Mega Man X style weapon system thrown in where you get like basically boots that can help you grip to walls you can grab a cape that can help you float uh, improvements to your weapons the ability to see uh, hidden uh, kind of platforms and stuff and the ability to punch through certain walls which I thought was really 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 cool and that's how you get the good ending you're also fighting against the enemy of Fred Fox who I think was in his Jurassic Park video game review played by Gilbert Gottfried and from what I understand this has changed from the original and then once you beat these first two games it unlocks another angry uh, video game nerd game which is very short but it's something like Tower of Torment, I think. It's just as difficult and unforgiving as the rest, but does feature uh, some kind of uh, newer content in it. And these games are fairly enjoyable if you know what you're getting into. If you're a fan of the angry video game nerd to begin with, you're going to enjoy the humor. Some of the levels are pretty funny, especially in angry video game nerd one. You're fighting uh, naked General Custer in a porno game. In uh, Angry Video Game Nerd 2, my favorite boss is where you fight. They're kind of like the battle toads, except they're like herpes, gonorrhea, and something else. And you fight Master Sphincter, and you expect it to be like a multi-tiered boss battle. No, you shoot the Sphincter in the face and he dies. You also fight like a Cylon mixed with like a Dalek that turns into a Scorpion, which is like a reference to the NES game of Star Wars, where Darth Vader turns into a Scorpion for some reason. And then you fight Fred Fux's giant robot. I had a lot more fun with that one because it felt like a lot more of a refined game experience. But you are getting three games here. This is actually a fantastic value. Like, I'm not a big fan of these 8-bit D-Make games, um, unless they're of super high quality. And this one is. They are punishingly difficult, but thanks to multiple uh, difficulty settings, you can make it a lot easier. And I know there's going to be some Twitch master who plays through the hardest difficulty level where you have one hit, one life to beat the entire game, and it's called Get As Far As You Can, YOLO, Are You Fucking Insane? Someone's going to do it, then they're going to do a speedrun record of it, and there's going to be some world record set somewhere. Um, in my playthroughs, I didn't unlock any of the unlockable characters, which I think you get like a couple different ones. I didn't get any of them. I only got a couple of the special items, so I guess I suck. But I still had fun with this. I, I had a lot more fun once I was able to walk away from this game for a few hours and come back at it, because it wasn't a matter of if I would beat the game. It became a matter of when I beat the game, and I think that was definitely very helpful in me having much more fun with the angry video game nerd one and two uh, deluxe here. So if you want to pick this game up, I highly recommend you actually do check it out. It's on Steam and the Nintendo Switch. So once again, that is Angry Video Game Nerd one and two deluxe that is coming to us from Screenwave Media and developer Freak Zone Games. You're dead. Your friends are dead. Your family's dead. Your fucking pets are being skinned alive. Your mom's a fucking whore. You suck at life. The whole world hates you. You're going to hell. Live with it. Game over. The Prime Minister of Sweden visited Washington today, and my tiny little nipples went to France. Gossip, rumors, panic in the streets. We're lucky. 
This Week in Geek News. Welcome back to ThisWeekInGeek.net. I'm your host, Mike the Birdman, joined with Alex the Producer. All right, we have a lot to cover in this edition of the Nerd News this week. Uh, one of the things that we're also going to be covering at the end of this segment, we have an interview with Nicholas Friedman. He is the editor of the website... You may have heard of this one. It's called Funimation.com. We're going to talk about a little bit of anime towards the end of this segment. Is that some sort of Japanimation? Oh, it's one of the weird cartoons. Is that is that one of those Japanimations where when I go to the Jumbo Video, it's in the same section or right next to the door that leads to the adult videos? Yes, nothing but tentacles. God, (laughs) mid-90s, man. (laughs) Mid-90s rentals where it's like you either had to go to a weird section in the video store or you had to go into the porn section because they didn't know that uh, they didn't know that like Record of Lodas War was not a porno. Yeah, <laughs> for some reason. So yes, it's like, got- it's like Ak- Akira. Like you would have Japan Animation section was a copy of Akira, Ghost in the Shell, uh, Vampire Hunter D, and then random episodes of like Robotech. Yeah, it was so strange. Um, so we have to talk about the big elephant in the room as we talked off the top of the uh, show with our little audio tribute to Sean Connery. We're going to to read a story from the BBC. So the Scottish actor was best known for his portrayal of James Bond, being the first to bring the role to the big screen and appearing in in seven of the spy thrillers. Uh, Sir Sean died peacefully in his sleep in the Bahamas, having been unwell for some time. His son said his acting career spanned seven decades and he won an Oscar in 1988 for his role in The Untouchables. Uh, uh, Sir Sean's other films included The Hunt for Red October, Highlander, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and The Rock. Uh, Jason Connery uh, said his father had many of his family who could be in the Bahamas around him when he died overnight in uh, Nassau. That was Saturday. Uh, Much of the Bond film Thunderball had been filmed there. Uh, He said, we were all... We were all working at understanding this huge event as it only happened so recently. So even though my dad has been unwell for some time, a sad day for all who knew and loved my dad and a sad loss for all the people around the world who enjoyed the wonderful gift uh, he had as an actor. Uh, His publicist, uh, Nancy Seltzer, said there will be a private ceremony followed by a memorial yet to be planned once the virus has ended. He leaves his wife, Micheline. I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing that. His sons, Jason and Stephanie. Uh, Daniel Craig, the current James Bond, uh, said Sir Sean was one of the true greats of cinema. Sir Sean Connery will be remembered as Bond and so much more, he said. He defined an era and a style. Uh, the wit and charm he portrayed on screen could be measured in megawatts. He helped create the modern blockbuster. They w- he will continue to influence actors and filmmakers alike for years to come. My thoughts are with his family and loved ones. In a reference to Sir Sean's love of golf, he added, wherever he is, I hope there is a golf course. Uh, Dame uh, Shirley Basie who sang the themes to three Bond films, including Goldfinger, paid tribute, saying, I'm incredibly saddened to hear of Sean's passing. My thoughts are with his family. He had a wonderful, he was a wonderful person, a true gentleman, and will be forever connected by Bond. Sir Sean from Fountain Bridge, Edinburgh, uh, had his first major film appearance in 1957's British gangster film, No Roll Back. He first played James Bond in Dr. No in 1962, and he went on to appear in five other official films, including the unofficial Never Say Never Again in 1983. He was largely regarded as being one of the best actors to portray 007 in the long running franchise, often being named uh, in such polls. Uh, and then there's just a bunch of extra kind of. The, I'll errata. say this the oldest movie I ever saw him in, like I, I obviously knew him as Bond and everything, but if you've ever seen it, there's a weird movie called Darby O'Gill and the Little People. And it's about Sean Connery, I, if I remember correctly, catches a leprechaun and wants his gold. It's okay. from 1950. It's from 1959 and has ridiculous special effects. Uh, it's like I think he was already bald then, but like it, it was weird seeing him with like thicker hair than normal. Uh, people forget that he was, I think, a Mister Universe, like Arnold was really? way back. Yeah, like like back before the steroids and everything, right? Before that was a thing. Uh, I'm like I'm just gonna look it up because if you look him up, I think it was Mister Universe or it was. Uh, that he was, he was something. It was something pretty big. Like he, I think he was a, a Mr. Universe or, or Mr. World. Uh, Mr. World sounds about right, but I'm not sure. And did you see that uh, the Kurgan? <laughs> Clancy Brown um, had Brown. said something about him, yeah. Yeah, what he said was uh, that when they were on set together, he was always smiling, always having fun, and he never referred to the lines of the movie as lines, or it was jokes. 
uh, ready for your next, ready for the next joke. Like everything, <laughs> like to him, even if it was a serious line, it was a joke. That was how he remembered his lines. Uh, and talk about somebody who could is the only person in Hollywood that would get away with never changing his accent, always being the exact same, having a very thick accent, or you know, almost bordering on like a lisp, even though it wasn't like just because of how thick his Scottish brogue was. Uh, but like when you think about Highlander, you have Connery, a Scotsman playing an Egyptian, an, an Egyptian masquerading as a Spaniard with, <laughs> with a Scottish accent and nobody questions it. And his co-lead Christopher Lambert is a American born in France with a French accent pretending to be a Scotsman. The Highlander movies were weird. <laughs> <laughs> and they both were terrible at changing their accents. Didn't even attempt it. And it was perfectly fine. Or how about uh, Connery? I'm a Russian submarine captain. I'm sure you are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it works. Like, <laughs> Actually, when I was putting together the audio tribute for him, I couldn't find a line or a scene out of Red October that wasn't overshadowed by music or had him saying something particularly memorable. Now I'm probably, someone's going to yell at me. So feedback at thisweekingeek.net, but I couldn't find anything out of that movie other than the Russian dinner scene where they're singing the Russian national anthem okay. and you've destroyed us all, or you missed us or some <laughs> bullshit. But one of the things that I forgot, and I got to thank my roommate Shannon for this, she pointed out that he was Draco and Dragonheart. I completely yep. forgot that. And when she suggested his death scene with Dennis Quaid, and he talks about going to the stars, I can't think of a better way to end that. And that's how I remember Sean Connery is doing things like that. Although the role I most know him for, and someone's going to be like, really? Is The Rock. Because I've never yeah. seen the James Bond movie with him. Maybe one of them. Okay. I, th I think he Okay, dude. Ninja. We have to rectify that this at, at some point. I would love to do... Actually, I, I had this idea, and I'm just going to pitch it to you right now. Because it's so little work, you and I could do it. Mm -hmm. It's a podcast. It's a 007 James Bond podcast. One okay. movie a month. Yeah, we, we can have, do that. We have content for the next three years I, I i could almost suggest that you could we could do a double feature they're not long movies yeah they're the like first, an hour and a half two hours each especially the first ones you could do you know two a month Re record them at the same time obviously like just and we don't have to do like a commentary just you know just talk about them yeah talk about them i would i'd love to do that with you because there's a couple i think i haven't seen or i haven't seen in a very long time I've seen all of his. Uh, you only live twice, being my favorite, even if it has some problematic elements. To I it. think is that the one with the ninja and Baron Samdi? No, that's Live and Let Die. Uh, well, you're you're mixing a couple together, but that's Live and Let Die. That's the first Roger Moore one. Uh, I loved Roger have, Moore. Ha have you seen Austin Powers? Yes. Everything in Austin Powers is based on You Only Live Twice. There's another one I know I've seen. I think I have seen a Connery one, but I'm trying to remember who what happened in it. Like, it's been so long, and that's the thing. Like, all the stuff I know Connery for is not his iconic stuff. Hell, I haven't even seen The Untouchables yet. What about Indiana Jones and Last Crusade? Yes, I saw that at a drive-in theater. Actually, one of my first dates I had with a girl. His, his 80s movies were uh were i think underrated like um outland i've only seen i think once uh he's in like was it time bandits he's in some weird shit uh zardoz from the 70s where he's basically naked running around in a futuristic world where in uh, borat speedo fighting aliens or something yeah and people last ah, well it's different it's it's hard to explain because i still don't fully grasp it <laughs> but there is a floating head that spits out guns and, and and yells at the savages he's one of them uh the gun is good the penis is evil are you serious yeah <laughs> okay and his, his his entire existence is shooting people and raping people and that's good apparently 
the seventies, folks. Um, yes, nineteen early seventies. This is after he's like, I'm not going to be James Bond ever again. And then they're like, What are you going to do? I'm going to grow a Fu Manchu, uh, wear a wig, uh, a speedo, and shoot people and rape people in a futuristic world where where people can be frozen in time with like time bubbles or some shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it gets it gets out there. But he did the Presidio. There's a lot of uh, Rising Sun is a movie that he did in the early nineties. I remember uh, that with, with Wesley, Wesley Snipes. Snipes. Yep. And uh, and Shang Tsung. Uh, that's a great movie. Uh, I never saw Entrapment, but I remember that being a big hit in the nineties. That's with um, um, Catherine Zeta Jones. That's it. Yeah. Uh, I never saw Finding Forrester, but it, it was like it spawned the biggest meme of the early 2000s. Remember the You're the Man Now Dog websites? Yeah. YMTD or whatever. And how et, that was the first internet meme website. Oh, you know, God. this stuff that, that's like, you know, that's even, I believe, predating E Bomb's world and all that sort of stuff. It's like early, early mass proliferation of the internet memes. Um, um, another so you, movie I saw him in, and I just remembered this now. It was his last movie. I remember seeing The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen in theaters. Me too, and I remember liking it. Yeah, same here. I th- I thought it was a cool idea. He he was seventy two or seventy three. He was visibly out of shape compared to what he had been even a year or two earlier. Um, but again, that you know, it's hard to stay in shape if you were somebody who like he wasn't like a Stallone. And he never did steroids. So, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not easy to stay in, in good shape when you're that age, especially that generation. But he was still believable. I still think he had two or three more years of movies in him. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he almost came back to play that old guy in Skyfall and then read the script and realized it was shit. So he didn't bother. I don't blame him. So, yeah, I guess uh, final words on this. Rest in peace, Sean Connery. Yeah. I hope. Do, do yourself a favor. And go outside of the box and look up some of his 70s and 80s movies because they're really fun and most people haven't seen them. Yeah, so do that. All right, so this news, I'm annoyed, but we'll, we will talk about it. So Persona 5 Scramble localization in doubt after title is missing from Koei Tecmo report. But the subheadline is, we wouldn't worry. Uh, Persona fans have started to feel a little uneasy as the yet to be confirmed localization of Persona 5 Scramble, the Phantom Strikers, the action title, which is released in Japan nearing the beginning of this year, featured a Koei Tecmo featured in a Koei Tecmo report back in July, uh, ex- uh, essentially pointing to a Western release at some point in the future. However, the company's latest report has no mention of Persona 5 Scramble, leading to fears that the lo- localization may be uh, canceled. From our perspective, we wouldn't worry too much about its absence. It would be a simple case of Koei Tecmo not wanting the internet to jump to conclusions when neither Sega, uh, when neither it nor Sega are yet ready to make any official announcement. The bottom line is the coronavirus has sc- has scuppered. I never heard that word before. What did uh, I say? <laughs> scuppered yeah it's so weird i've never heard that word i'm gonna um, look that up while you look because that's a weird one. Oh, and while i do that uh i i was incorrect uh he did not win mr universe but he competed in 1953 okay so it says uh the basically it breaks down to the coronavirus has basically made plans over the last eight months oh. or so with the next generation of consoles set to dominate headlines into the, going into 2021 it only makes sense to hold back on scramble hopefully we hear something concrete next year uh, um it's my it's, guess is I think it's pronounced skepper skepper okay it's it's, it's like it, scooper or skepper skepper it's a british verb and it means to sink uh, a ship or its crew deliberately i mean i think honestly um if they're going to do Persona 5 Scramble... It'll my, be PS5 exclusive. PS5 exclusive, and they'll probably drop it in um, February. And I say that because that's the end, end of the financial quarter. Or they'll be like, hey, guys, E3 is a- around the corner. We got a surprise. You know what's going to happen, I think. If they, I think what they're going to do is they're waiting for Sony to offer them a deal, just like how uh, Royal... Uh, was exclusive uh persona still is sort of locked right now to them uh what i see happening is because it'll be about a year and a half later i think we'll see it as a summer release and it will be a deluxe edition only on on the next gen they're not going to do a a multi-gen for it as a push for the next gen uh not that it's going to really push the the thing except that maybe it'll run 4k 60 versus 
If they did a deluxe version, I would love to see them include content from Persona 5 Royal because I want to see what happens to... That's what they'll probably do. Yeah. And, I, and because a year and a half, because it came out, was it last January? Yes, or, I think or so. This January or before that. It's been out long enough that they'll be able to do some enhanced extra stuff or DLC and just bundle it for the Western release and then call it a day. Because it it's a game that was made for last gen. There's no point in releasing it on last gen right now. Yeah, and it runs on the Switch. So if you want to have it really be something special, yeah, putting it out on the PS5 would make a lot of sense. And if you could include Persona 5 con- Persona 5 Royal content, like I want Kasumi in yeah. the game. And put I- Kasumi in there, put the Doctor in, uh, throw in maybe some remix songs, and then give an extra side mission or two. Yeah, like give us something to make it worthwhile. And me and Alex, even if we don't get the game for review, which we almost assuredly will, we'll buy it anyway. Oh, yeah. I, I think a lot of people would because it, what they're showing now with Koei Tecmo, it's not just the Dynasty Warriors style anymore. They're incorporating more things with them when they're doing their their properties that are not just their own. Uh, Hyrule Warriors is made by them. And this is where I, I don't worry. People are like, oh, it's not coming over. Just because it might have been published in Japan by them or co-published, uh, rights issues are different all around the world, right? Uh, Nintendo is going to be self-publishing uh, Hyrule Warriors, even though it's made by Koei. Yeah. So there's no reason to say that Atlas and Sega wouldn't do it here. Yeah. So don't worry, folks. We will see Joker, Mona, and everybody else soon. Hopefully yeah. very soon. Or, or at the very least, there will be a, a, a Southeast Asia release for the Philippines like there usually is that has English on it. And you'll be able to import it for 90 bucks or 100 bucks uh, to skirt around whatever rights issues there are. That, which happens how many times for the Gundam games? Yeah, Gundam and Kamen uh, Rider. You don't and, got much yeah. to worry about. Any any games that have rights issues or, or have characters from multiple games that you know may not be all under the same roof over here. There's almost always a, a Southeast Asian region free release that you can just pick up. It'll cost you 20 bucks more. Yeah. So be on the lookout. Hopefully we'll get some more information in the new year. Okay. So this one kind of surprised me, but according to news coming from Ubisoft, a live action uh, Assassin's Creed series is coming to Netflix. Assassin's Creed is coming to streaming devices and we're not talking about xCloud or Luna. A brand new live action Assassin's Creed series is coming to Netflix. The deal includes multiple different series, the first of which will be a genre blending live action epic, while others will be animated and anime uh, at adaptations the live action series is currently searching for a showrunner ubisoft film and televisions uh jason altman and daniel krennic will serve as executive producers for more than 10 years for more than 10 years millions of fans around the world have helped shape the assassin's creed brand into an iconic franchise says jason altman head of ubisoft's film and television los angeles we're thrilled to create an assassin's creed series with netflix and we look forward to developing the next saga in the assassin's creed universe assassin's creed's valhalla the latest game in the long-running franchise is out November 10th for the Xbox, blah, 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 and it goes on like this, which we will be doing coverage, um, I'm going to presume as of this release, which is Monday, November 2nd, we might get our codes this week, um, so we'll probably have coverage on on current-gen and next-gen hardware, so keep yeah. an eye out for that, just kind of a side note. Um, yeah, and, and to reiterate, we, you know, because there's a multi-generation thing happening now, uh, if you listen, we've had a review come out for Watch Dogs. That was on, you did the base uh, Xbox One. You have the original Xbox One. Yes. Right? So there's all these other platforms for it, and w- what we're going to be doing is working on playing them on next-gen and how they compare. So, you know, expect that not on release day of the consoles, but you know, within the release window, we'll be covering uh, covering that and seeing how they go. Because there's a wide range. There's, in some cases, like Cyberpunk, they've announced it's like nine versions of the game available. Yeah, so it's going to be <sighs> so, an interesting time. Yeah. Um, to get back to Assassin's Creed, I'm, I'm glad there's going to be a Netflix series for this, but I want to know how they're going to handle it. Because I think the series, in my opinion, after you got past the first three games and they changed up the lore a little bit, because I jumped in truly with assassin's creed black flag that's when i really started to pay attention yeah there was the war between the assassins and the templar over the pieces of eden and somehow aliens are involved in the first civilization yeah, yeah like I, I know the basic plot but again i didn't play really much until we started getting review copies together in the last couple of years so it's been like that those that first batch of games 
I only know tangentially what the story is. Like, I like games like Odyssey, which it just takes place. There just happens to be the Assassin Brotherhood and all that shit. Um, Origins is a wonderful game. My favorite game of the old style of Assassin's Creed. There's the ones. It's hard to say this. I like Black Flag the most because I like the characters the most. The gameplay I like the most is Rogue because it refines um, yeah, Black Flag. That, in a that was ways. the one where they, didn't you say that they made like the ship battles even better and all that? Yeah. Although you couldn't swim in the water or you would die because you're in the North Atlantic and cold. Um, although that being said, um, there was another one that I really liked too. And that was Assassin's Creed Syndicate because you could play as a brother and sister team. And that at one, one point is, you became Batman. They announced that one's not backwards compatible. That's really unfortunate. It's the, it's the only game that right now like they had those what were those like china something or other like where they had the three different three different country uh mini yeah, game yeah, there's china india and liberation i think yeah or liberation was the third game like yeah uh but it's china whatever yeah those little dlc games or those small psn games are not backwards compatible and syndicate itself isn't and that they, sucks because i just they, bought syndicate like a few weeks ago they released again. the pre- they released the press release saying it's not backwards compatible then pulled it within a couple hours of that press release and uh, issued a thing to Kotaku and other sites saying we're evaluating things. I hope I, so. I, I think it was a great game. It sounds like something was broken in the code that wouldn't allow it to work and they may be patching it. I but really I, hope but, so. But as of, as of recording, they said that it, it's the only one that's not backwards. Now, if they do the Assassin's Creed thing by adapting into a broader appeal media they can introduce the uh the assassins and create the assassins and the templar storyline they can leave out the um the abstergo shit if they really want to they can focus on more historical drama and more of the simulation if they want to because please please don't make it a, a green screen affair please don't make it um as dull and drab as the movie which i barely remember seeing bits and pieces of yeah the 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 movie wasn't good it looked the part but it wasn't what i wanted if if you're gonna do this go full game of thrones style a lot of physical sets use actual film cameras make it look make it look gritty but make it look colorful i mean unless you've got that disney plus money like the mandalorian that's the standard i think a lot of shows now have to live up to At, at the bare minimum you're going to have to make it look like what was that one they made that was supposed to be on Netflix a copy was it Marco Polo or something yeah like you yeah, got like it, it, go it for looked that. good it, it looked good it just wasn't popular good. yeah you got to you got to have something like that it's got to have that film gritty look or it's got to have uh high production value ultra wide screen all that sort of shit just don't stretch your budget too thin if you're going to do that show, make it six episodes. Make it a mini series. Yeah. Um, they did mention anime, and for years, people have said, Give me Assassin's Creed in Japan. Guaranteed, you'll see Assassin's Creed Samurai. Guaranteed. Well, look at how popular Ghost of Tsushima was. That's what I that that's another reason why I think like people like it's, people love ninjas. Look at oh, Sekro, Shadows Die Twice. We like ninjas. And and you want you want to make it super interesting now that we can do these like loading super fast on these consoles with the data you know how that game's coming out the medium where you're, you're like going between a, a ghost world and then like the real world mm-hmm. that's coming out where you can flip on the fly because of the how that velocity engine on the xbox yeah how about do a world where it takes place assassin's creed in tokyo and at the flip of a button you can transport to ancient tokyo or ancient you know japan yeah like there, where you're, you're, be- you're, in, you're in the same place only it takes place over like a several hundred years difference. And at any time you're traveling through, was it they called the animus? Is that what it was called? Yes. Uh, where you're, you're in Akibara, you're like downtown Tokyo now and you press a button and it goes like, like Wayne's world, diddly do, diddly do, wavy, wavy. <laughs> and you pop in and you're fucking 400 years in the past during feudal Japan. Yeah. Like there's so much possibility here to make things interesting I don't, as long as Netflix gets the right showrunners, I've got a lot of confidence in this. Yeah. I mean, just don't give it to anybody that's ever worked with Kurtzman Orsi or the, the bad robot flunkies from fucking. Yeah. yeah keep the Star Trek it, motherfuckers away it, from it. JJ um, Abrams, give him something stupid to do. Give him like trolls or go bots or some other 
garbage to remake. Let him remake the Fresh Prince show and have it run into the ground. J.J. Just... Abrams GoBots would be something I'd actually watch. If, if, we're, <laughs> if you're going to give Assassin's Creed to a, a, a showrunner that maybe has, hasn't has moved from movies into that realm, give it to a Ridley Scott. Give it to somebody who, who can do the visuals justice. Uh, you know, give give somebody else a try. Don't give it to the same flunkies that uh, know how to produce garbage. Yeah. Like, give us something quality. Give it, give it to the Russo brothers. Give it to, you know, give it to some some people that know how to do these these productions on a decent scale. I want someone who knows how to do a historical epic. Like, I don't know. That's, is what, like, that's why I was saying really, Scott. But is, like, Vikings still going? Vikings is still going. I think it's in its final season. Uh, do you th- I, I would say give it to... Uh, Maybe the, the Black guys- Flag people? Give it to the well. I was gonna say, oh, you mean um, cross skull and bones or crossbones or whatever. Yeah. It's called. Uh, I would say give it to the people that did Game of Thrones, but they're basically locked in with HBO. Yeah. So you and same with actually a lot of people are locked in with HBO now. Yeah. Uh, I would say if you're gonna give it to uh, historical sort of people, Ridley Scott's uh, Scott Free Productions would be great because it's not like he only does HBO, but as far as other things on TV that hold up that way. Um, you could give it to the people that did that. What was the Canadian show that was on Discovery and that with, with, uh, with Jason Momoa? It's called New World, I think, or something, where it was about uh, the, the settlers and like the natives and everything. It was it was a period piece. It ran for a few years, uh, a couple of years ago, and it did quite well. And I think the same team went on to make C, the the sci fi show with him on uh, Apple Plus. So there are teams that can do this on platforms that aren't getting as many eyes that you could maybe shift them over and get some more eyes on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately I'm very excited for this. I think it'll be super successful. So hopefully we will be shoving our hidden blades into many, a unsuspecting victim keeping with Ubisoft news though. This news, not so much fun. Far cry six rainbow six quarantine delayed past March, 2021. Uh <clears throat> Ubisoft has pushed two of its biggest names into the 2021-2022 fiscal year, meaning we won't see them until April at the earliest. Ubisoft has pushed two of its biggest games, Far Cry 6 and Rainbow Six Quarantine, out of the current fiscal year into 2021-2022. That means we'll see them coming be some, sometime between April 2021 and March 2022. During during an earnings call, CEO Frederick uh, Duguay, uh, narrowed that timeline slightly, saying the company expected both to hit the first half of the fiscal year. The company announced the delays as part of its recent earning uh, financial earnings statement. It also updated its expectations to reflect the delays of two high contribution titles, which said they were delayed due to production challenges related to work from home. Uh, the Far Cry team explained the delay in a statement posted to Twitter. Uh, Earlier this year, we introduced you to Far Cry 6, the most ambitious game in the series to date. We promised an immersive fantasy uh, to lead a modern-day guerrilla revolution set in a rich and exotic world filled with memorable moments, killer characters, and an epic story. While we know you are all anxious to get your hands on Far Cry 6, we want to let you know that we've been given more time to allow us to make the game you aspire to play while focusing on the well-being of our teams in the unprecedented unprecedented global context. Our team around the world are working in the studios and from their homes to pour their passion and creativity into making an unforgettable game, one we hope you will love. Far Cry 6 had been set for release on February 18th, 2021, while Rainbow Six Quarantine was targeting early 21. Quarantine had already been delayed in 2019 alongside Watch Dogs Legion and Gods and Monsters, now the uh, Immortals Phoenix Rising, at the time, CNO, CEO Yves Gilmont uh, chalked up the delays to the disappointing performance from other recent games, saying the extra time was necessary to make the projects lo- live up to their potential. Watch Dogs releases this week, or re- released this week, while Immortals is due in December. Uh, when Rainbow, when Far Cry 6 and Rainbow Six Quarantine were due to come out, will uh, will be well into the next generation of PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and Series X. S rather on the market. Ubisoft has already detailed plans to offer next gen upgrades with enhanced performance for the time being, at least it isn't making the next gen versions cost $70. Um, not surprised in the least. It's, you know, what, COVID. It, it, it's good. Everything. We don't want things all getting pushed to the same time because then, then we get fatigue or we're going to have like the crunch uh, of, of who 
who's going to have money to play all these games. It's better that they're staggering things out. So we got to wait longer. This year sucked for a lot of reasons, but we, we had droughts in the summer of games, but there's always something to do. I think we were affected a lot more in that there weren't movies to watch either. And a lot of TV shows that was in the pipeline that were supposed to be, you know, released on regular TV haven't come out or pushed back farther. So it feels worse than it is. As we get into next year, a lot of these shows in the next few weeks are starting up in the fall that would have normally started like in September. So there's other things to do. And I'd rather wait. Like I'm looking right now at a list of everything that's sort of confirmed from January to March. And like as far as larger titles, Hitman 3 is January 20th. Okay. That's pretty close to some of these February games. Would you really have wanted to have something else come out around the same time? Um, Ride 4 is on uh, Xbox Series X and PS5. That's a niche title. Uh, Pr- Prince of uh, a day after Hitman Three, Prince of Persia: Sands of Time gets remaked. Or remake comes out, at, you know, on last gen. So that's two games that are already that week of January. Uh, for RPG fans, uh, a week later is Atelier Rise of Two on the PS5, PS4, Switch, and Windows. So that's a, a you know a set uh, audience there. Uh, there's some remasters, uh, Disgaea Six, some some more RPGs there uh gal gun returns for all the perverts out there <laughs> that's the game that was uh has been in the news a bunch where it was pulled from uh from release on i forget which platform it was years ago uh and then it came back and then it's gone and now it's coming back on switch and xbox um and then that's it for january right now so you got two big releases in Jan- two i would say large releases in hitman 3 and prince of persia and they'll settle into their markets quite well, because uh, Prince of Persia, I imagine, is a teen or, or you know, a wider audience game than Hitman Three will be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then February, uh, Outriders comes out on my birthday on the second. Hint, hint. Square Enix, please uh, send over a review copy. <laughs> uh, that's the game that is, I think, gone under the radar a lot with people. That's the one that I. It, it's kind of like Square Enix's Mass Effect. It's Mass Effect mixed with uh, Gears of War. Okay. So third person Mass Effect Gears of War style, uh, and it looks it, it looks to be fun. I mean, sure, we haven't heard much else about it. Uh, Ease Nine comes out on the PS4, so that'll be action role playing games for fans of that. Uh, the same day, Werewolf the Apocalypse comes out two years or two days later. Okay. Uh, then there's some smaller titles: uh, Mario 3D World and Bowser's Fury is on the 12th. So that's your Nintendo game for the new year. Yeah. Uh, some other smaller titles riders republic comes out on the 25th that's the the ubisoft uh like downhill racing game oh yeah uh then uh the 26th the, uh, so a day later is bravely default 2 for the switch so there's a couple switch titles there uh then that's pretty much it for that month so there's you know outriders is sort of banking to be your hardcore gaming sort of game and then you've got a lot of your your rpgs and 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 then you've got your your general audience games in your super mario 3d world uh so it covers a bit of everything that would have been a lot of things to happen in january and february if that game had come out and then march right now what's confirmed is uh there's a harvest moon game uh yakuza like a dragon's ps5 native code version will be out the same day but i think most people probably will already have it for for xbox by that point uh and then you got Battle in Wonderworld on March 26th. That's that uh, Square Enix. It looks like a hybrid of a, of a 90s Mario style game mixed with uh, the. Remember that Knights franchise? On, yeah. On Saturn. It's like their answer to Banjo Kazooie. Uh, and then the same day, Monster Hunter Rise on the Switch. So you've got a few titles there. And, and it's good that they're spreading these things out. Because could you imagine if everything that was pushed was pushed to, the, to February and March? People don't have the money. I'm sure there's going to be some tax returns, but you think everybody's going to have the kind of money to spend on that, especially if if a lot of businesses are still closed? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it ain't so bad, I guess. I mean, I'm more looking forward to quarantine than I am anything else, but we'll wait and see. All right. So I got one more story here and this one comes courtesy of gamesindustry.biz and Sony has detailed its uh, PlayStation five accessibility features. Uh, the new console launch comes with additional options for visually and hearing impaired players, options to turn off haptic feedback. 
Uh, Sony has detailed a number of accessibility features built into the PlayStation 5 when it launches next month. In a blog post, Sony said the PS5 will include the accessibility features already already available on the PS4, including text-to-speech, closed captioning, inverting colors, and custom button assignments. It also adds a number of new features, including a voice dictation feature to allow users to input text without use of, without using a virtual keyboard, as well as a screen reader to assist visually impaired players and extra text-to-speech options that will take type text messages messages and speak to them aloud to party members to assist in deaf or hard of hearing users. Uh, all of the above features will support U.S. English, U.K. English, Japanese, German, Italian, French, uh, or sorry, France, French, Canadian, French, uh, Spain, Spanish, Latin American, Spanish at launch. Uh, the PS5 will also support color correction adjustment and certain supported games will allow users to customize common settings in advance of starting the game itself. Finally, Sony said the PlayStation 5 will allow users to reduce or disable haptic feedback and the adaptive triggers on the DualSense controller and will include improved audio enhancements for better spatial awareness. And then the console launches on November 12th. Uh, just get this over with. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm excited for this console launch, but fuck, do I want it just to be over? Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I, I, I found that article because we had had questions about what the accessibility would be like. What this says to me is with the button assignment thing, that is honestly not so much, I think, for as much as you think for accessibility and in, in, uh, in like mobility and dexterity, while there are features for that, uh, you know that the the Xbox has that adaptive controller that's way more advanced for that sort of thing. But I think that's there for the Japanese audience that's all crying and upset that they changed the the button input to in Japan to match the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Because every game that came out here would have everything remapped so that X or cross was the input button because X marks the spot for us. But in Japan, that's considered, I guess, unlucky. <laughs> so they always went with, oh, remember how you'd play like old... I think Final Fantasy VII and some of the other RPGs when they were first ported here on the PS1 were that way, where it was backwards from what we would normally have assumed. And there's been an outcry there where they're like, we want it this way. Why, why, do, why does the world get preference when you're a Japanese company? And it's like that kind of mentality from a company where 90% of their income comes from international orders. Yeah. Like Japan honestly means nothing to them compared to, to what Nintendo. Nintendo still focuses on Japan, even if 90% of their money come elsewhere, but Sony doesn't. It's the, the, the rest of the world is what saved them from bankruptcy. Yeah. So it makes sense for them to streamline it this way, but then give the option. If, okay, Japanese players, if you don't like it, you can swap it. And when you change those button inputs, what it's apparently going to do is in the games, you know, when it gives you the prompts, mm -hmm. you know, press this button, it will switch it so it's the correct ones. And, so if you, that, if and you, that can't be that hard a thing to implement. You just no, have to it, know it early enough in development. Yeah, yeah, it's an API. It's just like, you know, call this, this function. Boom done so that's good uh the color blindness and all those other things are good what i was interested in, in mostly was uh having had the controller now a couple days just to play around with obviously we can't get the force feedback on it because we don't have the systems the you can feel how the triggers would be more robust and how they're going to have that force feedback in there it is a good thing for those people that maybe do have arthritis or have uh disabilities that are based on mobility or, or dexterity, dexterity of yeah. of, of uh, of hand movements or hand shapes or anything, the ability to turn that feature off doesn't just mean that, hey, it's going to turn off the resistance factor. It will then tell the game, don't worry about it, that resistance feature. It'll reroute it to a different thing. You know how certain games now already sort of did that where it's like, keep mashing this button or you could hold the button down if you wanted uh, accessibility options on and it would just change how the game operates. Uh I think they did that even in like Last of Us and yeah, and, and that's games. how I did it. I'd like I'd rather hold the button than sit there and spam it. Yes. So in doing that, they did that in Ghost of Tsushima as well, where it was like you have to like do this click really quickly. They actually changed it so you could just hold the button. That's what I'd like to see. That is a move towards more accessible options for people that it's or even sometimes there's people that have processing issues where they read something and they tell their body to do something and it doesn't happen right away. Yeah, it so, like takes a second the process. Yeah, so for for that, like that's great that they're including all these features and that while these controllers are revolutionary in what they can do, they're going to be more for everybody than in the past. So, I think it's good. Yeah, uh, I would I do wish that the consoles would come here soon. <laughs> I wish I could just have it and get it. I don't even care if I couldn't play any games. I just don't want to have to go pick it up. <laughs> 
I, I I don't know. Uh, yours is ordered online, so it's going to be delivered, right? Yes. In my case, I went to my local store when I picked up my accessories, and they said, "Can we write you down for a time where we're you can book it to come in and pick it up?" And I'm like, "What does that mean?" Well, if we book you for a time, if you're here at, at that time, we will let you in before anybody else. And I'm like, "How? What if there's like a lineup of people? You're down for that time. We'll call your name. You come in." And I'm like, "Okay." And the local EB games are opening an hour early than they usually do. So they're opening at 10 a.m. instead of 11, which I think was their old business hours before the pandemic yeah. hit. Yeah. Um, and they said, all right, Alex, if you come in, we have you down for 10. And if you're here anytime between 10 and 1030, you can just come in and grab your systems on the Tuesday and the Thursday. And I'm like, OK. And they're, they're like, we do suggest you come in both separate days because the consoles are heavy because <laughs> i'm like oh because like with the packaging and boxes like how am i going to carry it they're like yeah you you are going to want to come in both days i'm like okay so they're taking reservations so that they don't have to deal with the crowd and sony was smart by releasing all their accessories early uh two weeks early you can come in if you had your pre-orders pick them up or come in and there's some stuff on the shelf even their biogenic accessories are there and that way on day one people can get in and out faster lower lines because you're only going to come in to grab your system and leave I believe what their plan to do is is to get all of the pre-ordered systems in and out of the door before the regular eleven o'clock business hours start. Hopefully, yeah. So, so for, cause I cause I asked, I said, Are you letting people in just to buy random shit, you know, at ten o'clock? They said, No. Between ten and eleven is just to let people get their systems. Well, hopefully this goes fairly uh, orderly. Obviously, yeah. we will have coverage of the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X. Uh, we'll probably do a prototype special on each console after we've had about yeah. a week or so uh, with them. I'll be taking some pictures. I'll be trying to take some video. It is going to be not professional. It's going to be quick, no frills. Here's how it looks when it's hooked up. Here's here's the settings of how I had to change settings, that sort of stuff. We'll have some video. We'll do some streaming. Uh, check the YouTube channel we have as more stuff comes out that way. Uh, we're still obviously audio primary, but you know, Hey, it's a new next gen. Let's get some video out. Yeah. So look forward to that. Uh, anyway, guys, we're going to take a small break here on this week in geek.net. And, uh, this past week, um, a friend of ours reached out, his name is John and he hooked us up with speaking with Nicholas Friedman. Now he is the editor of Funimation.com. And we sat down with uh, Nicholas for about 10 to 15 minutes to just kind of talk about anime, some shows you may want to check out because, Hey, we're, we're, in some interesting times, folks. So yeah, stay yeah home. I mean, it's it's a good idea to you know if you're looking for more content to watch because regular TV shows are either postponed, canceled, or not available. Uh, this is an avenue you may want to search down if you're a big anime fan. So uh, definitely, Nicholas gave me some suggestions, and hopefully, we will be talking about more of these in 2021. So we will be back, guys, right after this. And after this, we'll also have a review from Alex on a new piece of hardware you may want to check out. So we'll be back, guys, only on thisweekingeek.net. The first incident was in Ching Ching City. After that, reports of people with superpowers popped up across the globe. Before long, the supernatural became the totally normal. I'm going to be a hero just like him. Sorry, kid. It's not going to happen. Uh, I'm a normal kid without any powers. Yes, yes. You've got some very impressive quirks. Is it possible to become a hero even if I don't have a quirk? The school's already crappy. You really want to embarrass it more by failing so hard? I'm not going to give up. Welcome back to ThisWeekInGeek.net. I'm your host, Mike the Birdman. And well, guys, we have been enjoying this interesting time in humanity's history because why the hell not? But uh, I got handed an interesting email uh, late last week to speak with someone over at Funimation.com. You may be familiar with their streaming app, which is available on most major platforms. I use it on my smart TV, and believe me, that's convenient as hell. We're going to be talking with Nicholas Friedman. He is the editor over at Funimation.com, and we're going to talk about what makes anime one of the perfect things to consume during quarantine. And because we just recently had spooky season and we just had James Rolfe, the angry video game nerd, here on the show, I'd love to get his suggestions for some horror anime. Just because it's just a few days past Halloween doesn't mean you can't enjoy some of this thing because believe me the mariah carey songs about christmas are coming sooner rather than later i would like to welcome without any further ado nicholas to the show how's it going this morning 
Oh man, it is it is going well. I am so happy to be here and I am ready to talk some anime. I gotta say, Funimation has been one of the biggest supporters of This Week in Geek for a very long time. I got, got the chance to tour the offices in Texas a number of years ago and seen a wonderful closet just full of anime from floor to ceiling. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen in my life. Um, so, <laughs> my favorite closet in the building. Yeah, it was so cool. And just seeing the, uh, different people who'd worked on the like shows. I think at that time I'd seen Justin Cook, who was the voice of Raditz for Dragon Ball Z. I'm thinking, I recognize that voice. Um, <laughs> it was that, so yeah. weird. Um, so having you on the show is exciting because streaming apps have become such a thing that people are getting into be they amazon prime netflix hulu whatever wow. and funimation has had their own streaming app for quite some time but i'd like to know what is the big thing that people should be checking out because a lot of people are trying new and exciting things and this past summer i started getting back into funimation because i want to reconnect with my weeb roots because i'm a kid that went to anime north in the late 90s so i'd like to think i've got my og anime card there but i want to know what are the cool kids talking about these days because i literally have heard so many things but i don't know what the hell they're talking about yeah i mean look like anime is it is it is one of my favorite things. I mean, I know that might sound obvious because I, you know, I work at Funimation, but you know, I'm a, I'm a huge pop culture nerd, right? Like comic books, video games, um, manga, and and anime, and and especially, you know, being a part of Funimation, I've learned just like how incredible it is. Like everything from from the diversity of our fandom to to the way that the community celebrates each other to, I mean, obviously the anime itself, which, you know kicks all kinds of ass in, in almost every genre, every genre you can think of. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there, there's something for everyone right now. I, uh, one of the, one of my favorite uh, shows, one of my favorite shows of all time, um, first season aired a couple years ago, um, Kaguya-sama Love is War is a romantic comedy series. I know it might sound a little surprising. Um, some of the smartest writing I've ever seen uh, um, in, a, in a piece of television. I mean, it, it is, hilarious and addicting um and and this year you know we had a second season come out streamed exclusively on funimation uh the simulcast did and we've also got the uh the english dubbed version that's that's currently in production um also uh, streaming exclusively on funimation and and it it, it levels everything up from the first <laughs> from the first season and it's just more of that just hilarious hilarious antics i like to call it like it's like a love story meets death meets death note if I had to <laughs> if I had to find interesting. It. Yeah, it's it's basically a battle anime about um two uh two student council uh leaders, president and vice president. They're hopelessly in love with each other, but neither one wants to admit it first. So they they try and get each other into uh, into these situations where the other would confess first and it's uh it's cerebral. It's great. I love it. That's something I'm actually going to have to check out. That just sounds right up my alley because one of the things that I've wanted to experience now that I'm fully embracing my anime roots is I want to try different things. And I don't just want to go back to the Dragon Balls, which is amazing and fun and everything. Yeah. But there's only so many times I can hear Kami Kami Ha before I want to experience something a little bit more cerebral. And that does sound right up my alley. But I also want to know what the kids are talking about. So what, Nicholas, would you recommend somebody check out? Because I think Funimation has like free trials and everything going on. What would you recommend people check out if they've never really experienced an anime before, like horror, comedy, adventure, fantasy? What's out there? Yeah, I mean, well, short answer, all of that. <laughs> um, but let me give you let me give you two options, um, and you'll you know you're probably familiar with both of these options. But for those looking to jump into anime, I think I think these offer two different kind of kind of different. Uh, segments right um one obviously i've got to give a shout out to my hero academia um it is you know it is the shonen anime for a new generation um couldn't come in a more perfect time as as the the superhero fandom continues to explode and and you know comic book movies are all the rage and marvel and dc and all that but you know you've got my hero academia and it is um 
for those not in the know, um, it's about a kid named Deku. Um, he, you know, lives in a world where where a huge percentage of the world has superpowers, but he he doesn't. He is he is quirkless. The superpowers are known as quirks. Um, and this story follows his quest to become the number one hero. Um, and that's that's the hook, right? I mean, you gotta <laughs> you gotta dive in for more. I could sit here for ten hours and tell you about how how awesome it is and how like there's a character for everyone in the show and the powers are so varied. Um, and there's clear inspiration that is just so, it's just so awesome. And the animation, you know, is just, it's just great. Um, but that is, that is a great one, especially if you are a fan who may, uh, you know, who may have grown up with, with your late night tsunamis and, you know, maybe you've got kids now and you want to, you want to check something out with them. My Hero Academia is definitely, definitely um, the one to start with. One of the things that surprised me is just how much that particular fandom took off. Cause I know you guys, uh, before things went into lockdown, there were events to go see the, my hero academia movie. I know we reviewed that on our show. Um, when that came out, I know my friend Alex has been raving about that show for so long that I should kind of check it out and just hearing your pitch to it and his pitch to it makes me want to check this out. So now that I'm, not going anywhere fast. Um, I'm definitely going to check <laughs> that out. What are some other shows? Um, let's say I wanted to focus in on tabletop role playing because there's critical role. I've yeah. been a member of a number of actual play podcasts and I want to check out something up the realm of Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder. What's out there? Yeah, so I love this question. I um, <clears throat> I, I pitch anime all the time <laughs> to my friends on we do a Sunday night D and D, um, and I'm just always just gushing about the next you know fantasy anime that that checks those boxes. But um, you know, two two options for you: Goblin Slayer and uh, The Rising of the Shield Hero are are two uh, kind of kind of fantasy fantasy epics um, that have come out in the last couple of years um, that kind of fit into those those kind of tropes um and that kind of that kind of you know the the environmental storytelling that i I love about the indie i think um comes across in these shows so you know rising of a shield hero it's about this guy who's just kind of this loner in the real world he gets transported to another world um it's a it's an isekai series so that's that genre is all about getting transported to another world um and when he when he reaches this new world he finds out he has been selected as one of the four, you know, key heroes to save this realm from yada, yada, yada. Um, he is the shield hero. There's a spear hero, uh, I believe a sword hero, and I want to say a bow hero. I may be wrong on that. Um, but, and then it's just his his journey from, you know, loner real world guy to, you know, spec'd out, you know, defense, you know, full defense point, full defense stat up. Um, with his party that he, that he recruits as he goes along. Um, and it's, you know, it's got great animation. It's got great music. Um, and, and we've got, we've, we've got the English dub on, on Funimation. The, uh, sorry, go ahead. I was about to say, okay, I got one. I'd like you to, okay. So let's spin the anime wheel of funness. Let's go. What do you have for cyberpunk? Because we got cyberpunk 2077 coming out in just a few weeks. Yeah. I want something that'll take me to something kind of like night city or the sixth world from shatter on hell. If you got cyberpunk fantasy, thrill <laughs> me. What do you got? Um, okay. So, so this one just started airing. Um, so it's current season right now. Um, if you're, if, if this means anything to you, you might know where I'm going, but it's from the crew. Uh, I believe the creator of uh, Danganronpa. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is called Akudama drive and it is set um, kind of in a cyberpunk city um, in the future where there's this, you know, this gang of, of Akudama that each of them is a specialist in something, right? So you've got like Courier who specializes in transporting things, but he drives this, what I like to call the spider bike, which is a big motorcycle that can just um, like grappling hook between buildings, basically. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you've got uh, the main character. I wouldn't say main character because it's a bit of an ensemble cast, uh, a bit Suicide Squad-esque. Um, the comic, not the movie, um, <laughs> is uh, and it's, it's this like, like this ragtag group of specialist criminals that are coming together and going on these missions. And 
the thing that hooked me immediately was was the cyberpunk setting like the way that it it positions the the landscape immediately reminded me of blade runner immediately reminded me of cyberpunk um with an added dose of death game from obviously the creator danganronpa um so that i don't think you can go wrong with that it's i believe the simulcast is about two or three episodes in at this point um perfect time to jump in that sounds fantastic and definitely something for us to check out if you want something like shadow run or cyberpunk uh 2077 i guess uh nicholas as we begin to kind of wrap things up here what have you guys noticed from your kind of streaming data how many people are taking advantage of the app right now because a lot of people are at home quarantining there's maybe people jumping in for the first time have you guys seen a dramatic increase in numbers of people signing up for the service yeah so the thing that that is that is always interesting to me you know and obviously COVID and all that kind of hit and, and everyone everywhere was kind of like, you know, what do we do? Um, the, the thing that, that warms my heart a lot of times is when tough times happen, when things are, when things are tough, people flock to the things that, that are important to them, the things that, that bring them joy, the things that they're passionate about. Um, and I, I, you know, I can't say enough good things about the anime community in that they came out in droves you know, kind of as, as all this started to happen, not only to watch anime, but to, to support each other, um, to send kind words to, to, to us, you know, to everyone from our community manager to, um, you know, producers. And it, it was just amazing. Like the, the level of conversation that grew around, you know, the love and acceptance of the anime community, that I think has been the thing that that's, you know, you saw it before when you would go to cons and you would see the you know fans' faces light up when they they see a poster. I mean, my my face would light up when I see a, the Funimation booth every time we would go to a con. Every time I see it, I'm like, is this real life? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's that right. It's 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 the conversation in the community. Like, it it felt like it grew tenfold. Um, but really, it was like everyone now. You know, they flocked to the thing that made them happy and 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 talked with those like minded folks and. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. Well, I got to say, I'm glad to be back into the anime community. I am looking forward to checking out the shows that you've mentioned. The fact that there's something for cyberpunk, there's something for fantasy, there's something for superheroes. I'm excited. So uh, I guess, Nicholas, if people want to find out more about the app and the website, where would they have to go? Yeah. So, I mean, you hit Google, hit search Funimation. That's, that's what I always do. Um, no, but you can, uh, Funimation.com. Um, you're going to get everything from our streaming to the shop, because if you're obsessed like me, you need more stuff for your shelves. Um, and then our blog, which, you know, we have amazing writers that, that talk about everything from, from BL anime and, you know, best anime for Dungeons and Dragons fans. That's one of the ones we got to, to guides. If you're looking to jump into anime, everything from horror or supernatural anime you want to watch to, um, you know, if you're a, if you're a parent who, you know, you were a kid when Dragon Ball Z was on Toonami. Now you have a kid. How do you get them into anime? What's the right way? What's appropriate? Um, we've got everything. Um, and then of course the app, you know, hit every, any major app store, search Funimation and then start jumping in. All right. Well, once again, Nicholas, thank you for joining us. All right, guys, so that was my interview with Nicholas Friedman. He is an editor over at Funimation.com. Be sure to check this out. It is available on every major device. Like I said, I'm watching this on my Roku TV. I think it's fantastic. Uh, we will be covering more anime as we move into 2021. Look forward to us recommending the Funimation app in our holiday gift guide, which you can catch right here on ThisWeekInGeek.net on December 7th as we begin to take our holiday hiatus. So I'm going to throw things back to me and Alex. I'm sure we're talking about something stupid please forgive me but there is a favor i'd like to ask of you if i may you see how can i put this just say it i wondered if you have any more of that particular item what item scaly here wants cheese he's been whining non-stop i swear for three solid days he's done nothing but talk about cheese it's time to check out another headset here we have the epos gsp 602 uh, which is a uh, Epos Sennheiser partnership uh, headset. This is sort of to pair along with last week's coverage uh, of the uh, external sound card from them uh, in that it's sort of a one-two punch. This is a wired headset uh, with a detachable cable. 
Uh, it's actually a really nice braided uh, uh, cable here that doesn't snag or, or get caught on anything. Uh, and it, it offers two different cabling uh, solutions. One that has the uh, separate uh, connector for the microphone and the headphone part of it. And one that's the combined uh, tri or is it a quad pole that works with uh, laptops, more modern devices that only have uh, a joint combined uh, audio jack or for your like your cell phone or your gaming controller. Uh, and that's what allows for compatibility with like the PlayStation, the Xbox and so on. Now, uh, as far as the build on these, it's a, a all plastic design on the outside, uh, but actually fairly robust and, and rigid plastic it's not gonna you know fall apart on you in anything which is sort of what's expected with something that uh, is using higher end audio components uh, it has a boom mic that uh, uh, you can pull down to any position you need to putting it all the way up automatically you can hear a click it turns off the microphone uh, there is a dial on the right hand side of the headset uh, that is uh, a manual volume control cutoff so it's not going to turn your volume up beyond what the settings are on the device that's giving it audio it just cuts back or puts it up to the maximum that's being fed to it uh which is pretty standard for you know these these are analog headphones they're they're not uh you know digital wireless ones uh which is good because this way you can see what the full uh audio uh soundscape is going to be like without having any digital audio compression involved uh, super ridiculously comfortable ear cups. Uh, very large ear cups, very large drivers in here. So uh, I, I was fully expecting to have a, a large range uh, of frequency response, and I was uh, not disappointed with this. As far as uh, colors, there's a few different colors you can get. I have uh, the blue one, uh, uh, which I, I think looks nice, and it's probably going to be one of my drivers or daily drivers for next-gen gaming uh, now, uh, as far as some of the the other you know, features that come along with this, there's there seem to be a little bit of a, a tuning towards the higher end audio. Uh, like the mids were fairly rich. The the bass didn't seem very robust at first, and I realized it was a fairly flat. Uh, audio response, which is what I was hoping for, that it wouldn't be colored too much, but it seemed a little uh, tuned to go higher. But then I realized all I had to do, most games are, are lower, deeper bass anyway. Uh, I just enabled a, an EQ setting and I would, and automatically I just raised the bass a slight bit and it was perfectly dynamic after that. Uh, as far as the frequency response, they do go down to 10, uh, uh, 10 hertz. So... It, it, that's pretty low end. Like we're talking like subwoofer level of, of response. Uh, the MP is 28 uh, ohms, which means that they're not hard to drive. So devices like your phone can actually drive them pretty well and they'll get loud enough on, on that. Uh, a lot of higher end audio headsets generally take more power to drive. So it's always good to see something like this that'll work on a wide range of devices. The microphone is actually pretty decent. It picks up a lot around because it's a unidirectional so that you can put it down to whatever uh, uh, setting you want it to as far as where it's facing on your mouth. And it will pick up things around you. It picked up fan noise in my place. That being said, uh, like I would not use it for recording audio shows like we're doing here for podcasts. But I would use it for talking in a game because it seemed to cut out a lot of the low end and it picked up a lot of the mid-range that you'd find from the average person speaking voice and it was crisp and clear very clear uh which is a lot better than i can say for most uh pc headsets so uh where it really shines is uh in the audio response and the sound staging it, like as far as stereo staging things sounded like it's coming from all around you uh using it in conjunction with the uh the sound card and turning it into 7.1 surround mode the staging sounded fantastic it sounded like you were surrounded by actual multiple speakers other than just two large earphones so uh, kudos to them for that uh, it, it's going to be one of the better choices for gaming uh, with with a new console without you know going and spending you know several hundred dollars on high-end audiophile headphones 
This is a good medium. Go crazy. Don't mind if I do. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Welcome back to Twig. I'm, of course, Mike the Birdman. He's Alex, the producer. All right, we've had a lot of weird things happen in 2020, and, of course, this week is no different. So allow me to bring you the weird news from around the web, and this edition has some Canadian content. We're going to start things off in the good old city of Toronto, where a raccoon has got a job at Tim Hortons. So a Toronto raccoon takes it upon himself to get a job at Timmy's. If you've ever visited Toronto for any amount of time, you've likely had at least one memorable encounter with a resident raccoon or two who've long been the unofficial mascots of the city. They scale our construction cranes, break into our stores, homes, and swim in our pools. Otherwise, and get up to all sorts of entertaining mischief in the city, including apparently trying to get a job at one of our fast food outlets. A Reddit user, Reddit user taking a walk around their neighborhood after a day of working from home last week happened upon a hilarious sight on their way past their local Tim Hortons and was quick enough to whip out their phone and snap a photo of what appeared to be a raccoon working behind the counter of the coffee shop. Uh, Timmy's employees refer r- r- refuses to wear a mask on the job, uh, writes user finance underscore student wrote in a since deleted post on the social media platform alongside the photo, which shows the furry little friend in the in question investigating some cupboards under the coffee machine as a fellow employee watches on clearly nervous and on the phone with what was likely uh, animal control. Uh, I noticed this little trash pan. But you would have to shut down the restaurant to do a deep clean by law. Oh, oh God, yeah. Um, The second they step foot in there, it's not like a service animal. The second they walk in the building, like, depending on the health inspector, even if they don't go behind the counter, just walking in is enough to shut them down to do a deep clean. Oh, yeah. Like, this would have been major trouble. So, uh, one of the uh, quotes was saying, uh, I noticed this little trash panda that just couldn't wait to get his to get his little Timmy's fix on. Cute little bugger was rummaging around through all the cabinets and didn't pay any mind to the Tim, Tim Hortons employees around him. Poor workers had no idea how to, do, to deal with it, the poster added. Also noting that the lineup of customers was growing as workers attempted to deal with the situation. He was wearing a mask all right, but he's got it around his eyes. One user cleverly uh, commented on the instantly popular thread. Hey, um, where do you keep the Timbits? Another chimed in. And yet another, this is the most Toronto thing to ever Toronto. According to the <laughs> original poster, the raccoon was spotted from the window of the main and Danforth Timmy's, and the manager of the location was apparently pretty angry with their new addition. The raccoon was right up near the window of, at first, rummaging around the stacks of cups, then working his way down to the cabinets, opening and investigating each one. No idea how he got in there, but the employees just kept their distance, uh, the blog, or the poster told uh, blog T.O., the photo has since been circulated on multiple uh, other platforms, including Weird Toronto Facebook Group, where it has been a great source of laughs in the way most of the city's raccoon moments are. For residents, what are some pretty dark times in the second alliteration of stage two lockdown in Ontario's second wave of COVID? Unsurprisingly, this instance is not the first time one of Toronto's beloved mass critters has been caught on camera causing trouble while looking for food in a coffee shop. And I remember that he was at like a coffee time and he was like running across the ceiling. Dude, the the only thing more Canadian than that uh, and more local Canadian would, would be like a Canada goose working at a fast eddies drive through <laughs> <laughs> or or like i'm trying to think of anything more than that it would, uh, it would have to involve a goose and it would have to be uh, I, I don't know it'd be like a goose running the drive through at the Sh- at swiss chalet dumping sauce into your plate <laughs> i remember uh one of toronto's raccoon moments there was a dead raccoon that was on the side of the street and somebody had set it up as like a as like a street side vigil oh lord because yeah. because city crew didn't come and clean it up for well over 12 hours there was uh, like offerings of timbits there was candles you, there was no, there's roses you remember you remember the the garbage disaster when they uh uh when the mayor refused uh, to bow into the it was the i think the garbage strike that happened yep and then the, the city stank like New York for like months. Yeah, because I, I had a lot of press events in Toronto around that time. If this is the right thing even, you're talking about. Even after, yeah, it was years ago. Even after the uh, the garbage was all cleaned up, the city smelled forever. And, and when that happened, there was just, there was a rise in raccoons, like a massive rise. It was taking over the city. 
<laughs> yeah, like and Toronto raccoons are especially uh, interesting because They're they not, are they are not afraid of you, not at all. In in fact, they know you're afraid of them, and they will come after you. Yeah. They're like, what if you mix a possum with a raccoon and a Canada goose with the like the attitude of a goose, and you get and like you look and the and the raccoon will be like, get fucked, and they start running at you. Yeah, they give no fucks. Uh, moving on to our next story, this one comes courtesy of the Independent. A fireball that fell to Earth in 2018 contains pristine extraterrestrial organic compounds that could help us tell how life forms scientists say. Uh, The meteor arrived on Earth in January 2018 as a streaking fireball visible across the sky of the U.S. Midwest. Scientists were able to track it using weather radar and hunters picked up the meteorite from the ground before its chemical makeup was changed by the exposure to liquid water. Uh, Now researchers say the material they recovered offers them the ability to explore such rocks as they might appear when they are still in space, but using the equipment they have down on Earth. They described their early findings in a new paper published in the Journal of Meteoritics and Planetary Science. This meteorite is special because it fell onto a frozen lake and, and was recovered quickly. It was very pristine. We could see the minerals weren't much altered and later found that it contained a rich inventory of extraterrestrial organic compounds, said Philip Heck, a curator at the Field Museum, associate professor of the University of Chicago and lead author of the new paper. Uh, These kinds of organic compounds were likely delivered to the early Earth by meteorites and might have contributed to the ingredients of life. As the fireball arrived, the researchers were able to track the pieces using NASA technology, usually reserved for monitoring the weather. Uh, weather radar is meant to detect hail and rain, said Heck. These pieces of meteorite fell into that size range, and so weather radar helped us show the position and velocity of the meteorite, and that meant we were able to find it very, very quickly. Uh, the first pieces were retrieved by meteorite hunter uh, Robert Ward, who found it on the frozen surface of Strawberry Lake in Michigan. He gave the discovery to the Field Museum, which began the research that culminated in the newly published paper. That research showed the meteorite was an H4 uh, con chondrite which uh, represents only four percent of the objects that fall to earth but it was even more remarkable because it was picked up so quickly that it remains relatively untouched by the conditions on earth uh, that could help researchers in their quest to understand how the organic compounds that helped life form on earth one of the one of the possibilities is that they brought to the planet by similar meteorites and so studying such examples could help us understand whether such a story is likely scientists who also study meteorites in space <clears throat> sometimes get asked excuse me do you ever see signs of life? And I always answer, yes, every meteorite is full of life, but terrestrial earth life, says Heck. As soon as the thing lands, it gets covered with microbes and life from earth. We have meteorites with lichens growing on them. So the fact that this meteorite was collected so quickly after it fell and it landed on ice rather than in the dirt helped keep it cleaner. That's kind of cool. And I never thought about meteorite Mm. contamination being a real thing. Well, there's bacteria everywhere, right? So, I mean, the, yeah, like it landed in the perfect environment. I mean, I guess the only place it could have landed even more perfect would have been the the Arctic or the Antarctic. Yeah, the, on, the South Pole would be the <clears throat> would be the most, you know, pure, right? Providing it didn't hit snow. Yeah, like like this was like, literally like if, like if if it hit a glacier on the on the South Pole. Yes, then that would be ideal. And that's how you get the fucking thing. Um, hey, do you want a Genova? Because that's how you get a Genova. Oh, yeah, we do not want this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so, yeah, I think this is a rather cool uh, discovery. I'd be very curious to know how far this place is from where, like, Aaron lives. Because I know he's, like, a climatologist. So I wonder if this fell into his realm of expertise. Kind of curious. Okay, so this next story comes courtesy of Exclaim.ca. Someone stole the Cool Runnings bobsled from a Calgary bar. Cool Runnings is a Canadian cinematic classic, but now its legacy is being tarnished after someone stole a bobsled from the film in Calgary. The bobsled shell was recently stolen from the former Benjamin's building with with, uh, Calgary police saying they were alerted to the theft on Monday afternoon, October 26th. According to the police, the sled from the 1993 John Candy film was stolen sometime between October 21st and 25th the sled had been gifted to the ranchman's bar by the disney film production crew and had been hung outside below the roof on the calgary country bar <clears throat> cool runnings told the real life tale of the jamaican bobsled team competing in calgary in 19 in the 1990 or 1998 winter olympics 
1988 because it says 98. So unless they're foretelling the future, uh, yeah. Ransman's had served as one of the filming locations. Ransman's is currently up for lease after closing last month. Following the news of the theft, an original member of the Jamaican bobsled team featured in Cool Runnings is now pleading for that whoever stole the sled to bring it back. It's gone too far now, says um, Devin Harris, who is also one who is also the chairman of the Jamaican Bobsled Federation, told the Canadian press this week, just bring it back. The bobsled shell is painted the colors of the Jamaican flag, black, green and gold. And it was originally a gift from the Canadian bobsled team. The sled was then later painted for cool runnings. It's kind of like this work of art that somebody go and hide in a basement and they're the only ones who have the opportunity to enjoy it, said Harris. I have no idea what they're going to do with the sled. There's nothing yeah, they can do with it, right? It's nothing you can sell because they people know where it came from. Yeah. Uh, he added, he thinks the theft is some sort of prank. Police are currently examining security footage and asking any potential witnesses to come forward. A reward is being offered for the bobsled shell's return. I mean, that's not something you can just easily steal like you're right like someone's gonna know hey i got the sled from cool runnings oh bullshit uh yeah and it's not the kind of thing you would be in a bar that doesn't have decent security cameras yeah i mean it just it just doesn't make a lot of sense and unless this is going to some rich weirdo what's the Uh, point and even then if you brag it's theft It, it could be racism just to destroy it I hope not. I, I, hope, I, I, I it's it's Alberta. Yeah, it wouldn't. I'm, so, me. I'm sorry. You've seen how some of their like they're removing a lot of rights of people there. If it's not about fossil fuels, it doesn't matter. Uh, Don't read Alberta Facebook groups. I've made that mistake. It's they're basically the they're you can translate a lot of the Trump supporter ideals to them. Yeah. So and not not everybody obviously, but the current political party in power there. Yeah, it's ugly, folks. So this next story, I want to send a special shout out to Ken, who will be playing in our Stargate SG-1 campaign, sent in this courtesy story courtesy of Gizmodo. As if the platypus couldn't get any weirder. The platypus is nature's crazy quilt, and as this strange creature looks like about half a dozen different animals all rolled into one, it turns out platypuses were hiding yet another conspicuous feature. They glow in the freaking dark. It is not enough to be a mammal who lays eggs, sports a duck-like bill and webbed feet and hunts using electroreception and wields venomous spurs. The platypus also glows green under ultraviolet right because, of course, it does. Details of this unexpected discovery were published earlier this month in the science journal Mammalia. It's a cool name. Uh, the platypus now joins a very exclusive club as, as it is only one of three known biofluorescent mammals, the other two being opossums and flying squirrels. That said, the platypus does stand alone as the only mammotrium or egg-laying mammal capable of pulling off this trick. The only other uh, extinct mammotriers are four species of echidna. And of course, biofluorescence and biolu luminescence is one of many organisms such as fungi fish photoplankton reptiles amphibians and at least one species of tardigrade the same team involved in the new study led by paula spath anik from northern college uh were also the ones who discovered biofluorescence in flying squirrels last year this discovery has been uh this discovery happened by accident during night surveys of lichens their field observations were later confirmed with specimens of flying squirrels kept at a museum with this in mind, the scientists decided to try their luck with another nocturnal uh, crepuscular mammal. Platypuses, like the flying squirrel and opossums too, are active during the dim hours of dawn and dusk and overnight. From the new study, the team analyzed three uh, museum platypus specimens, two males and one female, sourced from the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago and the University of Nebraska State Museum. Uh, the ICUN uh, Red List currently describes the platypus as a near-threatened species and a population trend in decline. Uh, platypus fur appears brown in visible light, but as the new research shows, their fur glows green or cyan under UV light. So for your next socially distanced cocktail party, you need to tell your friends that th- platypus fur absorbs UV wavelengths between 200 and 400 nanometers and then gives off visible light between 500 and 600 nanometers as an optical process during uh, fluorescence. As the paper points out, both males and females appear to exhibit this trait. The author advertises a smidge of caution given the paltry sample size. The researchers are confident that the fluorescence we observed is not a property of museum specimens in general. And then it goes on like this. Um, 
They're they're basically like remember the '90s creepy crawler machines. Yeah, it's like someone <laughs> made a mold of these things and like, hey, you know what would be cool? Yeah. Let's put some glow in the dark dye in there. Or those weird, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, not the Polly Pocket, the boy version. Uh, Mighty Max. Yeah, remember those weird play sets where it was like it would be random creatures spliced together. Yeah, I mean. I think bioluminescence is cool. I mean, they're, I mean, they're, they're sorry. They're they're like a chimera. They just like survived. Like in the Greek times, when we killed off all the different beasts, like the chimera and the uh, the minotaur and all this stuff, we're just like fuck those little bird things. We'll leave them over on the island. <laughs> exactly. It's so weird. I mean, they're they're not. Yeah, they're poisonous, but they're not big enough. They're not flying. They're not flying cat the snakes that are going to come kill us so we'll, we'll leave them they stay on the ground in the water in australia there's a lot of dangerous shit over there they'll fight it out <laughs> <laughs> i mean bioluminescence is one of those things that fascinates me because i love seeing like those glowing jellyfish you see yeah. or the weird stuff you see in like the really deep ocean or um one of, one of my favorite bioluminescent tricks it's not real but it's in a video game in Skyrim, when you go in certain caves underground and it's lit entirely by bioluminescent fungi and it looks really well, cool. Well, those, those things, those fungi, that, that thing that exists, but not to that brightness level. Yeah, exactly. It's not like a Dungeons and Dragons encounter. But except still. except underwater. The underwater, like, plants can do that. I think it's tremendously neat. So big thanks to yeah. Ken for sending in that story. That's weird. And this could only come from Alex. You're um, welcome. <laughs> I used to live in this city. So York Regional Police sees $150 million worth of pot, three kangaroos, and two zebras in organized crime investigation. Dozens of charges were laid after York Region Police seized about $150 million worth of illegal cannabis, said Sergeant uh, Andy uh, Patterden. Said. For Americans, cannabis is legal in Canada if you buy it through the government or from uh, a government-approved business or grow your a own. Very small under i think it's four or five plants per person under 30 grams on on hand uh for it to be 150 million dollars of of uh, illegal cannabis that's a lot that's that is truckloads yeah like i remember there was one crime that happened this was like 10 years ago there's a former uh beer brewery in barry and there was a huge pot operation that operated out of there for years and nobody thought to look look there but you would drive by this thing on highway 400 and there was thousands of pot plants being grown in there <laughs> highway 400 known as pothole and and death trap central where you'd hit bumps and your car would go flying <laughs> yeah not a fun time especially during the winter yeah. uh so uh so uh investigators with the or or organized crime bureau said guns gangs and drug enforcement unit laid the charges as, as part of project green sweep which uh, took place over the summer he said uh the project which is part of the police services cannabis enforcement strategy saw officers conduct 15 search warrants at various cannabis grow operations throughout york region including markham king stoville and east uh Gwilmberry. uh those search warrants resulted in 37 arrests and 67 charges uh patent and said uh several exotic animals including three kangaroos and two zebras at the location in schaumburg uh and animal control was notified and is investigating he said the investigators believed organized crime continues to exploit the access to cannabis for medical purposes do you, do you know regulation. how hard it is to get a kangaroo in canada yeah i'd like to know how they got that through customs this is like there's gonna be a movie made about this this is like our own tiger, tiger king, king bullshit you can't get a like they're from a country they're from a tropical country i'd like to know if there's like a kangaroo queen of the north what like the borg queen what <laughs> yes. oh, it's, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and i'll tell you kangaroos i've i got to pet a kangaroo at a pet show here yeah uh a red kangaroo their skin or is like the fur is like super th it's like crushed velvet or like uh Ooh. it's like a it's like it's like a mixture of very soft velvet and corduroy pants Ooh, they sound like and, fun to touch and they're oh yeah and that, that that of course is part of an actual show where they brought them in from a zoo and blah 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 and they're super friendly i also got to touch a 200 year old or nearly 200 year old tortoise what the fuck does this mean okay so i'm 
reading the story further yes. ahead. I was going to say, while well, I was waiting for you to catch up on there, because I'm like, it's going to get weird. Okay, so it just goes into organized crime and all that bullshit, whatever. Yeah. Officer sees nearly 29,000 plants, okay, and nearly 1,800 kilograms of harvested cannabis. That's a lot. With a total street kilograms value. kilograms is like just shy of four or 5,000 pounds, like four or five tons. Now, this has a total street value of approximately $150 million. They also recovered seven firearms, two crossbows, and a conducted energy weapon. Yeah. I'm guessing that means a taser. I, like, I saw that. I'm like, what the fuck do they have? Lightsabers and blasters? No, conducted energy weapon. Can, uh, conducted. Cattle can also, prod? It can be a cattle prod. It can also mean a rail gun. Oh, cool. So we're playing Unreal Tournament with cannabis now. Yeah, like it could mean an electrified gun that fires nails or weird shit, too. That's weird to think the cannabis guys have fucking rail cannons now. And kangaroos. And kangaroos. Be now, prepared, people. Here is my question to you and to the listeners. Were the kangaroos used as a ruse to hide drugs in them pouches? <laughs> the ultimate drug mule. You know how terrible how fucking terrifying it would be if you're a police officer running in, in there and you've got kangaroos that are high on fucking weed and cocaine or whatever and they're pulling out crossbows out of their pouches to shoot at the at the cops <laughs> they're trained they're ready but, for it you seen those videos where they get mad and they kick people imagine what they're going to do when they have arrows they're fucking ready for you man so that's going to do it for this edition of Twig's Weird News this week. As always, if you want to submit uh, stuff to the show, feedback at thisweekingeek.net. You can also uh, interact with our Facebook page, our Twitter, uh, to submit stories there. We always check those socials, so be sure to get involved that way. But we're going to take one final review here on the show. And this is going to be Alex taking a look at the ports newly released for No More Heroes 1 and 2. We will, we will be back, guys, right after this, only on thisweekingeek.net. What? You've got news? Does it have to be like now? For reals? The first No More Heroes is getting ported to Nintendo Switch. Hell yeah! No More Heroes 2 Desperate Struggle is coming to the Switch too. When to drop? And she. Oh snap! That's awesome! Moe! Moe! Super Moe! Just a quick review here of No More Heroes 1 and 2. Uh, desperate struggle on the nintendo switch this shadow dropped as you know earlier in the week and uh i had a chance pretty much right after the uh the, the shadow drop happened to request a review copy of each and i i've been playing them for the last couple days just to get a feel for how they work because we all know that they're two uh of the better games of the last generation and we're you know I, I think sorely missed not having him on the Switch and knowing that the third game is coming to Switch. Uh, it, it, this was a, a healthy, fun, late October surprise, just in time for Halloween. Uh, now, playing them, uh, the, the actual graphical style fits well with the Switch and does not uh, introduce any like weird artifacts or hindrance. A, the gameplay itself is pretty buttery smooth. The, there's load times when it's loading into certain scenes or between levels uh you'll see a stutter in maybe frame rate or how the game is performing but once either of them like it just applies to both by the way uh once you're in like and you can control your character and you can run around and do things it seems to be pretty buttery smooth they've done a pretty good job of optimizing it uh you know xseed marvelous is publishing this and i think for 20 bucks a pop that's pretty good. You're, you're getting fantastic games and, you know, building hype for the, th the third game coming. Uh, I, I, you know, personally, I can't wait. Uh, I'm happy that they dropped these and they didn't just go, hey, we can charge, you know, X amount of crazy money because people are desperate for more games coming out now. No, they put them out at a, a discounted, uh, you know, budget release price for two premium, fun, ridiculous, over-the-top games. I uh, highly, highly recommend, you know, if you didn't get yourself uh, a next-gen console or you're just a Super Switch, uh, you know, 
fanboy fangirl uh, and you're you know clamoring for more games to play no more heroes and no more heroes 2 desperate struggle are out now and you really don't want to miss them and i think i finally found what i was put on this earth to do knife goes in guts come out knife goes in guts come out spare my life and i will grant you free will ah! knife goes in guts come out all right, guys. Well, that has been the first show of the newly launched website. Big thank you to everybody who has stuck with us for the last 13 years. Without you, the show is not possible. We definitely appreciate all the input that we get across our socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, email. We appreciate you guys, every single one of you. Uh, so coming up on the site this week, I'm not entirely sure what we're doing. I know we were going to do a future imperfect, but Steve Megatron has some family coming in from out of town. So we're going to do that next week for Star Trek Discovery. We'll cover the first four episodes. Um, we how's, will... a, how's about, uh, unless we can't, uh, do do we want to do a uh, a loose cannon? Yeah, we'll probably do another loose cannon. Uh, uh, I, I know that we were all talking about maybe doing Blazing Saddles. Okay, so that's a good idea comedy blazing saddles and then there's young frankenstein to go with it uh because they came out the same year both mel brooks should be should be fun either one or the other or both we'll see what happens um because i think uh, aaron's available to record with us so yeah so yeah. we will reach out to him um also big thanks to uh N nicholas friedman and funimation for uh speaking with us this week once again please check out the funimation app across all major devices or if you just want to go to funimation.com you can find out more information uh over there i will be checking out goblin slayer in my hero academia uh in the very near future and alex has been recommending me black clover for quite some time um so i'll be checking yeah, out like, that you, you want to get that you know it's that uh D and D fantasy Harry Potter ish Lord of the Rings bug with a bit of uh Dragon Ball Z, that's sort of what you're going for, then those are great shows. All right. So uh myself, I will be working on the book club, uh console launch. I have a lot of books to review from DK Publishing, from Modifius, Titan Books, and I will also be reviewing the Mall Rats uh Blu-ray that just came out recently. Um, I don't have the details right in front of me, but I'm watching that tomorrow. Uh, so I'll have that for next week's show and I'm probably sure I'm going to have something else. Uh, Liam, uh, because he lives next door to me, he's going to help me with a board game review. I got Kung Fu Panda, uh, which looks kind of neat. I also have world of tanks from Gale force nine. I'll be taking a look at that. Some of these may be in the holiday gift guide or appear a little bit before, um, so yeah, I got a lot of stuff to play. I still got another two, three weeks of school until my next, until this course ends. And then I got a little bit of a break until my next course starts. Um, so yeah, Birdman is busy plus console launches. We're going to die. Um, <laughs> it's going to be fun. I'm going to look uh, forward to it either way. I have, I'm working on, uh, Yakuza like a dragon or Yakuza seven. Uh, I'll have current gen, uh, Xbox review, uh, this week wednesday or thursday something like that and then we will have but that's going to be like a deep impressions and thing how it works on the current gen and then once the new consoles are out we'll have a final review uh coming out where i'm playing it on the series x because it's one of the uh first games coming out that does auto transfer and give you the uh the next gen experience that way uh I, so far from what i can say is i think you'll find it interesting michael Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, if you haven't pre-ordered it, that might be one to keep on your list. Uh, I can't go into plot details or anything else uh, yet, uh, but I'll say that that I am playing it. That's sort of been my focus. I have uh, a couple other things on the go. Uh, we will be receiving this week, I think Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, some new product to look at from PDP. Uh, it's been a bit since we had something from them, but they've got some stuff for... Uh, the Series X launch, I guess some accessories they want us to check out, uh, as well as, I believe it's the the new mini Pro Controller they put out for the Switch. So we'll be checking that out whenever it arrives, and we'll uh, keep you up to date. All right. So uh, anyway, guys, as always, thank you for all your support. Like I said, please get involved with us in any way you can. We look forward to doing this show each and every week until December 9th or 10th, or yeah, when we take a break, you will get our uh, annual holiday gift guide, and then we will come back on yeah. the second Monday in January with yeah. a brand new show. So, and there will there will be content. It just means the main weekly show will be taking a hiatus. Uh, we'll still have some reviews if there's critical ones out there. There'll be some commentaries and perhaps uh, you know some 
loose cannon or future imperfects that will pop up. Uh, but as far as, uh, you know, live new content, the weekly stuff that will be uh, taking a bit of a break from. Yeah. So anyway, guys, until next time for this week in geek.net, we have been Alex, the producer. I've been Mike, the Birdman, saying be excellent to each other. We'll catch you guys again next time right here on this week in geek.net. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response, were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought? Thanks for listening to this episode of This Week in Geek. Hungry for more? Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net. You can subscribe to the podcast, browse our Twitter and Instagram, and leave your thoughts on today's topics. If you'd like to give us some feedback, send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. Tune in next time, and remember, lower your shields and surrender your listenership. We would be honored if you would join us. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night.